Tonight on the Daily Debrief, a South Carolina woman fights back from the witness stand. The witnesses have changed their testimony since they went through the kidnapping trial facility. Yes, they've lied. Prosecutors say she kidnapped her husband's much younger mistress. Her tactic? Lash out at other witnesses. It could have been false testimony. Tammy Moorer says she was having sex and then looking at Christmas lights when authorities say she was really making this woman disappear. Plus... And I said, no, no, not Kendra. The Texas murder for hire case that left this woman dead. That's tonight on The Daily Debrief for Monday, October 22nd. Everybody. Welcome to the Daily Debrief. Closing arguments today in the case of a South Carolina woman accused of kidnapping her husband's lover, who was half her age. For the second day, Tammy Moore took the stand in her own defense and took an oath to tell her side of the story. She and her husband, Sidney, are said by prosecutors to have both played a role in kidnapping Heather Elvis. Several witnesses testified that Elvis may have been pregnant with Sidney Moore's child. Elvis has never been seen or heard from since the date of the alleged kidnapping. Tammy Moore fought back against questions about a box for a pregnancy test which turned up in Heather Elvis's trash can. Authorities tried to say the Moores bought the test right before they placed a suspicious call to Heather Elvis from a nearby payphone. The box was in Heather's trash can. It wasn't during Sydney's trial. Okay. Uh, you would admit the testimony here was that the box was in the trash can. I agree. The witnesses have changed their testimony since they went through kid the kidnapping trial with Sydney. Yes, they've lied. Yes, ma'am. Someone called Heather's phone. It's on the records, but it's not Sydney, and it's definitely not me. So you would agree. 121, y'all leave out at a Walmart, and 10 or 11 minutes later, this phone call has been made from the kangaroo right up the street to Heather Elvis. I didn't make a phone call to Heather Elvis. Did, would you agree? You've heard the testimony, correct? I've heard the testimony. Okay, and you've seen the documents, the discovery, correct? I, I didn't deny that she got a pay phone call I'm telling you I didn't make a pay phone call and Sidney didn't make a pay phone call. He was forced to sell the cops that when they held him against his will. Okay. It just happened that 10 minutes after you buy a pregnancy test, right up the road from the Walmart, that payphone called Heather Ellis. What you're trying to trick everyone into believing doesn't make sense. Had it been before, you could have probably fooled people with that. This doesn't make sense. During that contentious cross-examination, prosecutors also tried to force Tammy Moore to agree that her truck was caught by nearby surveillance cameras going to the place where Heather Elvis disappeared. Moore was combative against that claim as well. Do you remember Friday when the expert came in? I don't consider him an expert, but... Do you remember him saying it was your truck? Of course I do. He's been paid a lot of money. He can say anything you pay him to say. My truck is not, but you have told people that and led them to believe that over the years. But my truck did not go to the landing that night. Okay. I promise you that on this holy Bible. My Ford F-150 never went to the Peachtree landing that night. We came home at 310. But have you been in here for the testimony of the time of the videos? People lie, Nancy. Okay. Lifesay. I'm sorry, Miss Lifesay. What do you, I don't know what to call you. Miss Lifesay or Nancy Lifesay? Have you seen the video? I saw the videos you all produced, yes. It's not my vehicle. That cross-examination came after this testimony from Friday, where the defendant said she had no clue what went on at the scene where Heather Elvis disappeared. Did you ever go uh, to Peachtree Landing, the end of Peachtree Road, on December 17 of 2013? I never have. I never did that. To your knowledge, did anybody that you know or associated with you go to Peachtree Landing on the night of December 17, 2013. No. After midnight on December 18, 2013, between the hours of, say, midnight and noon the next day, did you yourself go 
to Peachtree Landing. Did anybody that you know or are associated with go to Peachtree Landing between midnight and say noon the next day? At times, of course, this trial has been a referendum on the affair Heather Elvis was having with Sidney Moore. Defendant Tammy Moore seemed unfazed by that. And do you remember her showing you a um, room key and that it, the room had come back to Sydney Moore? She did not show me a room key, no. What did you take a picture of? She showed me a receipt. Okay. That he had rented a room? It could have been false testimony, just like the phone records. Okay. And did she uh, show you where Sydney Moore had rented a room? She showed me something to lead me to believe that, yes. Okay. And you took a picture of it with your phone? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you told her you didn't care if your husband had had sex with a hundred women? Something like that, because it's at that time it wasn't relevant. Okay. And you were saying at that time that you were in an open marriage? I was in an open marriage, and no, you do not know who I was actually having sex with because I would never put it on the phone. Okay. Tammy Moore also testified on direct examination about a bizarre tattoo just about, just above rather, her husband's groin, which contains her name. Was, was Sydney forced to get by you to get that tattoo? Yeah. Was he forced by you to get that tattoo in retaliation for having a, an affair with Heather Elvis? No, I don't think he knew Heather Elvis at all. But... 2012 January. Did that tattoo and the application of that tattoo on your husband's abdomen in 2012 have anything whatsoever to do with Heather Elvis? It did not. Okay, so what was Tammy Moore doing when Heather Elvis disappeared? First, she was working with her husband, who was an after hours restaurant equipment repairman. Then, this. I wanted to see karaoke. I still, that's my thing. I love karaoke. There was nothing going on up there that, that we could be, or be entertained. So that's when we went out, we had sex in our car, in the backseat of our car. That's what my original charge was, was indecent exposure. Where did that occur? Around Broadway at the beach. All right. So you had sex with your husband yes. in, the, in the vehicle? Yes. What else did you do? Um, right after we did that, there was a bit of a mess. He went to a gas station to get stuff to clean that up. So he stopped there at that station. But there was some Christmas lights he wanted me to see that were made out of cars that had them in white. He drove out there and looked around. Um, All right. Just typical nothing. So it's nothing sinister. Okay, she says nothing sinister. Attorney Sam Zangane is with us tonight from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Sam, let me get this straight. So karaoke, sex, Christmas lights, that's the alibi? The, the combativeness from the witness stand here, we've got a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of questions about what's going on inside the mind of the defendant here. Sam, do we have you? I guess we lost some. Okay, let's move on. Earlier on in this case, the defendant's sister said she cared for Tammy Moore's kids in the overnight hours when authorities believe the Moors were actually kidnapping Heather Elvis. Right you saw me swear or from the evidence you're about to give the court in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, and the whole truth. Have you died? So have you died? Okay, folks, on the night Heather Elvis disappeared, the sister said that she dropped the Moore kids off at 3.10 a.m. However, she said that was not unusual. The sister also testified that police twisted her words in a report about the infamous payphone call authorities believe the Moores placed to the victim not long before she disappeared. Expected testimony from a series of other relatives backfired for the defense. A sheriff's deputy testified that five witnesses violated a sequestration order. At least some of the violators were the defendant's children. The five violators were watching the trial on a laptop and on cell phones from a room in the courthouse, even though the judge forbade it. The judge had several punishment options, but went for the most severe. He ordered that those witnesses would not be allowed to testify at all in the case. 
One bombshell piece of testimony involved a purported picture of the victim after she disappeared. The cousin who claimed husband Sidney Moore showed him the photo did not offer many details. The prosecutor's office that's handling those cases is the same prosecutor's office that's brought this case, right? I believe so. And at least in your mind, you're hoping you get some kind of break for giving information, right? No. No? No. Are you hoping they'll treat you worse? Um, hoping they'll treat me equal to everybody else. Cousin's credibility by accusing him of being a liar since he was a teenager. The defense also said he was making things up in return for special treatment. Heather was petrified of Tammy. She thought she was going to show up to our job. She wanted nothing to do with it. She wanted nothing to do with Tammy. She just wanted to be left alone. That was the roommate of victim Heather Elvis testifying about a final phone call the morning Heather disappeared. That roommate also talked about the relationship, as you heard, between Heather Elvis and both Sydney and Tammy Moore. We're going to bring Sam Zangane on now. Uh, we're going to uh, ask a couple of questions. Sam, I wanted to try to get this uh, to you earlier here. So let me get this straight. We got karaoke, sex, Christmas lights. That's the alibi. <laughs> Wow, yeah, so I caught you off guard. No, nah, listen, let me tell you, uh, it, it seems like uh, Tammy's using uh, the Donald Trump fake news, everything's fake, nothing's nothing's real uh, defense. Anything that hurts her is fake, the receipts are fake, the pictures are fake, that wasn't me, that, 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 that's a fake video. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, I don't know how any defense attorney would have allowed her to take the stand. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, it's it's the client's position, and, and if she really wanted to take the stand, she could have overruled her attorney's uh, advice, which I think is what happened because, I mean, I don't think it helped. They, well, they well the, way, the way that you react indicates the way some jurors may have reacted. Okay, so a couple of other things here. Combativeness from the uh, witness on the stand, the defendant, that is. Calling the prosecutor by her first name to try to catch her off guard, uh, looking at the jury and accusing other witnesses of lying. What's her analysis of that? Well, listen, the one thing I did like was that she made a lot of eye contact with the jury. And when I instruct my, my witnesses, whether they're experts or civilians or, or even, God forbid, if I put a defendant on the stand, I always let them know, look at the jurors when you're answering. Because you can't find a form of bond, and if you do it with just one person, that may be enough to convince them of your innocence or of the credibility of the testimony that you're making. Yeah, so we'll try to... That, yeah. Try to peer through those jurors here. Okay, so let's talk about the roommate. The roommate said Heather Elvis was still in love with Sidney Moore. It's it's sad to look at it in that respect, but that roommate seems really believable as to what was going on in this uh, triangle here. Yeah, I mean, listen, I don't think there's a question as to whether or not that they were having an affair. I mean, yeah, they, they, she was uh, she was sleeping with a married man, and, you know, I don't know if that really helps uh, um, a jury in this case. I don't think that that's, that was ever a real question in this case. Um, I think that she came across credible, but as a juror, yeah, you know, your, your roommate's sleeping with a, a married man and then she's talking to you about it. I don't really know how much that's going to sway a jury other than potentially like maybe emotionally swaying them for the, for the one hour that she's on the stand. But I don't think anything she says sticks in terms of whether or not this is going to have a lasting impression with the jury. Okay, one more question with you, Sam. The uh, other bizarre facts in the case here, Tammy Moore apparently chaining Sydney to the bed to try to keep him at home for a while here. Uh, th that's just another bizarre fact in this strange case with all these strange facts twirling around. Yeah, that happened to me once. I thought that was in college, you know. Uh, listen, we don't need to know about that. You're not the defendant <laughs> here. Okay? Now, listen, all, all these things coming up, the tattoo, the, the chaining some of the events, this is a toxic relationship, okay? And all these things, in culmination with the way that Tammy testified, I think a jury's gonna look at her and say that this is this woman has the, the potential to do what the, the, the prosecution's accusing her of doing. And that hurts them in, the, uh, in a circumstantial case. Now, ultimately, I don't know if it's enough 
to convict to convince a jury to convict her beyond a reasonable doubt. But I don't think she helped herself when she testified. I can't disagree. Sam Zangane, I know we'll catch you on the flip side here in the second half of the show, but still ahead tonight here on the Daily Debrief, emotional testimony today in the Texas death penalty case, which left one young woman, a young dentist indeed, dead. Plus, a Pennsylvania man convicted of murdering two family members has confessed to yet another crime. But wait until you hear just what else authorities think he did. That is coming up after the break. And welcome back to The Daily Debrief. Testimony in a Texas death penalty case began today. Christopher Love is on trial for the murder of Dallas area dentist Kendra Hatcher. Authorities say Hatcher was dating a man with a jealous ex-girlfriend. That ex-girlfriend was Brenda Delgado, and authorities believe she was the mastermind who hired Christopher Love to rob and kill the victim. A third defendant named Crystal Cortez was the alleged getaway driver. She and Delgado will be tried separately. Today, though, the victim's mother relayed the agony of waiting for her family to gather before hearing the horrible news. My husband, he had to drive two hours to get home that night. And Jamie wouldn't tell me, and Jeff wouldn't tell me anything. And I thought at first it was Dave, but they're like, no, Mom, no, Mom, just sit here until Dave gets here. And so when my husband got there, I'm sorry, um, he came in the door, and Jamie had me on the couch, and he said, she said, Mom, it's Kendra. And I said, no, no, not Kendra. <laughs> and they said she was shot. And I'm like, what? What do you mean she shot? And Jamie said she didn't make it. And I, that's all I really remember. I, mean, I remember that so well. A witness who was there for the shooting said he was coming out of the elevator when he heard the commotion. So we've got now, DNA. Just up. immediately you heard screaming, but it didn't sound like human. It sounded more like an animal. So obviously we're going to be looking over in that direction. And all you hear is, pop, pop, which is two shots, and then it's just quiet. So once we heard those two pops, we ran to our vehicle, got in the car. By that time, the vehicle that was uh, up top, of the parking lot. It came down, took a left, and then went back around. By that time it got behind us, we pulled out and no go ahead, sorry. <laughs> let's, let's break that down a little bit. So as you exit the elevator doors you hear a gunshot. No, we hear screaming. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. And when you say it didn't sound like human screaming, what was like she was out of breath, basically. Like she was that scared to where she couldn't really scream where she was out of breath, basically. And then the next sounds you hear, did you immediately recognize those to be gunshots? Oh, yeah, immediately, because it's two pops. What else could that be in a parking garage? And what's your response to hearing those gunshots? Straight to the car. And that Texas case continues tomorrow. Now to Ohio, where a man was acquitted Friday of murder and manslaughter charges. Carl Wimpy Jr. was on trial because of a brawl at a Toledo area tavern. The victim, 59-year-old Daniel Vasquez, died several days after Wimpy punched him. Wimpy testified that he only threw the punch to protect himself from others who were attacking him. Here is the emotional verdict. We find the defendant, Carl Wimpy Jr., not guilty of count one murder in violation of 2903.02b and revised code 2929.02. Appears to be signed by all 12 jurors. We find the defendant, Carl Wayne Wimpy Jr., not guilty of the lesser included offense of voluntary manslaughter, 2903.03a and 2929.14a1 appears to be signed by all 12 jurors. We, the jury, in above entitled action, for a very fine and say that we find the defendant, Carl Wayne Whippy Jr., guilty of the count of Florence assault, 2903.11A1 and D. And for more incidents making headlines, here is Anthony Velez. Here are today's top crime stories trending on longcrime.com and across the country. Former NFL player Ray Carruth was released from prison after serving an 18-year sentence for orchestrating a plot to murder the mother of his unborn child. 
Carruth was found guilty of conspiring to kill Cherica Adams to avoid paying child support in 1999. Adams was shot four times and died a month later. The unborn child was delivered but suffers from permanent brain damage and cerebral palsy. The former Carolina Panthers wide receiver will now be on a nine-month post-release program and is reportedly seeking custody of his son. The New York Police Department recalled nearly 3,000 body cameras from service after one exploded inside of a Staten Island precinct. According to investigators, a Vivu LE5 body camera allegedly exploded after an officer noticed smoke coming from the bottom of the unit. New York currently has over 15,000 body-worn cameras, but the other 12,000 units are an earlier model, the Vivu LE4, which have not had any explosive defects. A man in Pennsylvania convicted of murdering his stepdaughter and wife reportedly confessed to another murder and authorities believe he might be connected to as many as 16 murders. 59-year-old Regis Andrew Brown pleaded guilty to the slayings of his 53-year-old wife, Michelle Brown, and his 35-year-old stepdaughter, Tammy Greenewalt, earlier this year and was given a life sentence. Brown allegedly confessed to police he was the gunman behind the 1988 cold case murder of 45-year-old Bryce Kenneth Tompkins of Newcastle. Authorities now believe Brown could be responsible for up to 16 murders between 1986 and 2016 in the eastern part of the state. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Sam Zangane, if this is true, 16 murders, this guy is among the worst of the worst, but legally in many states, prosecutors cannot convict on a confession alone. That's correct. A, a confession alone, standing by itself, in and of itself, isn't enough for a prosecutor to bring charges in most jurisdictions. They need something else. They need some sort of corroborating evidence. So it's going to be very difficult, I think, for them to tie this in legally, unless this defendant wants to just kind of go ahead and say, yeah, you know, I did all these, all these murders. And, uh, uh, and plead uh, guilty, you know. You know. Yeah. Sam, uh, appreciate your time today. We're going to move along here. Uh, many of you folks uh, spent the weekend watching season two of the hit Netflix film Making a Murderer. That series chronicles the disappearance and death of Wisconsin photographer Teresa Halbach. Stephen Avery and his nephew Brendan Dassey were both convicted by Wisconsin juries of murder and related charges. Defense attorneys have long argued that the case was fraught with procedural issues, illegal conduct by the authorities, and planted evidence. bullet that's much more consistent with chapstick DNA than blood or uh, the inside of the scalp. I believe that what happened is that chapstick was removed with a swab because we can see cotton fibers on the bullet and the chapstick was put on the bullet. For those of us who covered that case from its very first days, it seems to be a case that will never end. That's all for today on the Daily Debrief. A reminder that the Law and Crime Network will be streaming several of the trials we discussed beginning at 9 a.m. From all of us here at the Law and Crime Network and the Daily Debrief, have a good evening.